Alex Golden, setting the pace. Welcome back to the show, man. How are things? Hey, things are good, man. That's what we do here. We are just keeping that pace set. And uh, we are we are getting ready for the home stretch of the NBA season to come to an end and get ready for some playoff basketball. Most definitely. Subscribe to Setting the Pace wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to Combo's Court wherever you listen. Subscribe to the NBA report right here. Um, would greatly appreciate it. Alex, big game last night. Lakers. You know, high scoring game. It's uh it's right up the Pacers alley. What did you make of it? Did you learn anything new about the Lakers? Did you learn anything new about your team? Okay, well, I will just say this. The last, I believe it's eight games before this Lakers game, the Pacers ranked fourth in defensive rating. Their defense has gotten a lot better, and people did not get a chance to see that on NBA TV last night as they gave up 150 points to the Lakers. I think that was the most points have given up all season long. So, yeah, honestly, it was uh, it was crazy in this game, and I know there's been a lot of hoopla on social media Talking about the foul, and, foul discrepancy, I believe it was 43 to 16, something like that. It was pretty wild there. And it wasn't that way early on because I'm just going to tell you this. Before LeBron James and Anthony Davis had this little powwow meeting mm. with Mark Davis there at the center of the court before Miles Turner got to shoot two free throws, it's like a two point game. I think Pacers were like about to go up by two after Turner hit those. 31 to six for the foul calls, 31 on the Pacers. Six, the final two and a half quarters on the Lakers. I'm sorry, but what I learned about that game is that LeBron James has an influence on NBA officials. And I think there is such thing as an intimidation intimidation factor because what he gets away with, a lot of other guys cannot get away with in terms of how he talks. Like Pascal Siakam was like, man, you're bad to Mark Davis at the free throw line. No tech. LeBron James is just ripping dudes left and right. And they're just like, sorry, LeBron, you know, so I, I hate to cry about officiating, but like, come on, like that, that to me was just insane last night. It was a very tough watch. It was interesting because Adam Silver came out and saying there was no directives. Then I think we learned there were directives to, to make it a little more physical. I feel like that, you know, that helps the Knicks, but it might hurt a team like the Pacers, right? Mm. Well, I mean, it hasn't hurt them so far as they've been able to be fourth in defensive rating prior to this right. game. So, right. I mean, we everyone knows, like, the Lakers' foul discrepancy compared to everybody else. Like, it's insane. Like, the amount of fouls the Lakers get, like, and and people can throw the narrative out there, like, yeah, they are a physical team, but, like, come on. This is an old team that's getting a lot of bailout calls, in my opinion. Some of that stuff they were calling on the Lakers or calling on the Pacers last night, they weren't calling on the Lakers. Now, they were early on, and then all of a sudden, it's like the narrative, you know, flips. So, I uh, I hate to be that guy that's like, oh, my team lost. I'm going to cry about the officiating. I never really do that, but I just felt like it was so egregious in this game. And that's one thing I learned. But I did I did learn that this Pacers team does have a lot of resiliency because they came back and made this a game after being down 17 points in the fourth quarter, cut it to three a few different times and really put the Lakers on their heels. But, yeah, I just felt like the officiating was just – it was whack uh, combo. I won't lie. It was whack. Talk to me about the state of the Pacers because there was so much hype around the team earlier in the season. The whole NBA heard everything about the Pacers. Halliburton was having a great year. Um, post-injury Halliburton, Siakam now in the mix. How do you feel about the Pacers now compared to earlier in the season during like the in-season tournament time? Yeah, totally different team now, right? Okay. They don't have Bruce Brown, Buddy Hill, Jordan War. Obviously, Jordan War wasn't really in the rotation, but Bruce Brown, you know, Buddy Hill, they were a lot smaller. Mm. And, and now... Throughout all that, they've traded away those two guys. They've lost Benedict Matherin to an injury for the rest of the season. He had shoulder surgery, I believe it was, last week. So he rejoined the team on Sunday for the first time since having the surgery. So that was good to see. But, yeah, I, I feel like Siakam, they got him at, like, game 42 of the season. So they had him for, like, uh, the last 41 games of the year. And he's looked really good. And I like when he's being more aggressive. And we saw that against the Lakers, like, 36 points was a really fantastic game from him. And that was his highest scoring as a pacer, like continuing to find out where he fits in. And you mentioned it. Tyrese Halliburton is the head of the snake here. Still like this is still his team. And what we saw from him during the in season tournament run was just so incredible. Like yeah. we saw a guy that was top 10 in the league. Like there was no doubt about it. Like he was clearly setting himself to be that. And I even think after that, like he did have a little rough stretch there, but he started to get it back before he went down with that injury. So since the injury, it, it's been an uphill battle, and he had a really good game against Golden State the other night, was shooting the ball pretty well, and, and Rick Carlisle said, you know, I think he looks better than he did just two weeks ago. So 
hamstrings, I'm sure you know this better than I do, are a very tricky injury. And so as he continues to try to grow from that, I don't know if he'll ever be 100% healthy this season. It might be something that he has to work to get 100% for next year, but like he's good enough to play. He's just been really up and down. It's kind of been a, a bit of a roller coaster ride, shooting the ball particularly poorly uh, aside from that Golden State game and against the Pistons, which that's not saying too much because those defenses have been pretty subpar. So right. I, I'm just hoping that Tyrese, these last 10 games here, can kind of find that stride again. But uh, I think that this team, They've got their starting five solidified. They kind of know who they are. And I think that's going to help them going into the playoffs. When they signed, when the Indiana Pacers signed Siakam, I thought it was the perfect mix for the team because it was a running gun team, but they didn't really have that guy that could get into the mid range. I mean, Halliburton got a lot better at that since college, but they didn't really have that go-to guy that gets in the mid range, get his shot off, or you know how Siakam likes to do, you know, hard dribble and then a spin into the lane, like, all that stuff kind of occupying space that the team doesn't doesn't really occupy, right? Like it's an analytic driven team. Um, have you seen that from Siakam? And on top of that, do you think he could be the second best player on a championship team with this Pacers moving forward? Yeah, I mean, he's a professional scorer. There's no doubt about it. I think at this point right now, and I think it's 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 weird to say this, but he's the best player on the Pacers right now. Mm. Uh, he does it on both ends of the floor. I think there's still a lot to be desired defensively because of a lot of the bad habits he did create with Nick Nurse's defensive scheme. So still trying to get him a little bit more disciplined, but he's got the size and the want to to be a little bit more well-rounded defensively. So, you know, I think he's 30, 31 years old. So like he's still yeah. in his prime, like he's still coming into his prime. And I think that, at this point, like it was a great trade for the Pacers. There's no doubt about it. They needed somebody like him. And I think he's really helped this Pacers team stay afloat because had they not traded for him and they kept Buddy Hill, Bruce Brown, like you can say, oh, the team chemistry would be better potentially, but the talent would be much worse. And I don't think they'd win as many games. So he he clearly kind of took that bar up a notch in terms of what they can do. And in terms of him being a champion uh, or uh, the second best player on a championship team, that's a tough thing to say about a lot of players. I mean, I don't know if we're going away from big threes in the league or if we're going to, you know, dynamic duos. Uh, I, I wouldn't say necessarily see him and Tyrese as a dynamic duo that could win an entire championship together. Oh. I, I think they would need someone to kind of play that three and, and give them a little bit more than what Aaron Neesmith does, even though I am a Neesmith guy. So that, that's kind of where I'm at on that. It's fair he was the third guy in Toronto, right? It, it, was, uh, it was Kawhi, Kyle, and then probably him. I, I think a lot of people said he was the second best player that season. But but Kyle, I mean, Kyle was just like as a leader, you know. It's Kyle I, I, was great. Yeah. Marcus Saul was great. Serge Ibaka yeah. was great. Like they just had, you know, uh, did they have Serge at that time? I don't know. Did did they have Mark? Uh, yeah, they had Mark when they won the championship. Okay, okay. They traded for know. him at the deadline. They okay. had Danny Green. Okay, so it might have been. I don't think they had Serge Ibaka. I think he was in oh. Orlando for some reason. Okay. Uh, whatever trade that was, right? He got traded to Orlando. It was a weird thing. I can't remember. He might have been on the team. I feel bad now that I don't know, but still. <laughs> They had a, they had a pretty solid team, and I, and I think you know Kawhi was clearly the head of the snake. But like Kawhi Leonard at that point was like top three in the league when he was playing at that level. So that well, Kawhi like, was the Kawhi felt like the best player in the league because it seemed like at a, there was a point where he was the best offensive player and the best defensive player in the NBA mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah, there was a case. I remember when people said that. Now I, I feel like a lot of people get upset when you talk about him being one of the greatest of all time, just because the inconsistencies with the injuries oh, yeah, and things like yeah. that. But longevity uh, matters. Like, like how long your peak was matters, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, he, he's a good player though. Like if you're looking at like top 10 players of the last decade, I think he should be in that list. I mean, it's just tough though, because of the, the longevity, like you mentioned. Yeah. Speaking so. of that, what you're, you're about to play the Clippers, a lot of struggles for the Clippers lately. I don't know if it's a lack of leadership. It kind of coincides with Russell Westbrook being out. I mean, James Harden is closing out on his own team. Um, in the court, I don't, I don't even. He's putting people in headlocks. I don't even know what's going on with James. But what have you made of their struggles when they were doing so great before everybody went down to Indiana? You know, after that, it seemed like it, it, it was tough after the All Star break. Yeah, I just kind of wonder if this team is kind of coasting into the playoffs because they built such a big lead. You know, mm -hmm. standing wise, they went to All Star break, kind of just haven't refocused yet. Um, I do think that they missed the element of Russell Westbrook off the bench. I just think that he's kind of one of those guys that when those guys may be going through the motions, like he doesn't know how to like, just not play hard a hundred, you know, times out of a hundred times. So that to me is a big part of it. But like, if you look at a lot of their games, like they've had some close games here, some close losses. I just kind of wonder if they're just not all the way mentally focused, knowing that they're probably a lock to make the playoffs and they don't really care. 
who they face probably in the first round because I feel like they feel pretty confident in who they are as a team. But, you know, the way that they've been playing and people have been talking about it a little bit more, it wouldn't shock me if they just come out here and beat the brakes off the Pacers on Tuesday night <laughs> I mean, or Monday night. I just – that just seems to be like the Pacers get everybody's best punch for whatever reason as of late. But uh, the Clippers, I mean – I'm not worried about them. I mean, I know their their play since the All-Star break's not been good. I don't think they beat a team over 500, right? So, uh, right? Have they beat a team over 500? No, I don't think so. Yeah, so I, yeah. I think that's what the stat I saw. So, yeah, it's clearly a, a, a warning sign, I think, and I don't think Coach Lou is happy about it, but I think the players like James Harden, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, these are guys that have been here for a long time. And I just wonder if, like, uh, you know, the longevity of being – in the regular season so long and playing so many years of basketball, like it just, yeah, we'll, we'll focus when we need to, but I don't like that mentality. Yeah. Westbrook looks like he'll come back this week. Um, his energy has been missed. I, I think he does bring a team energy that sometimes lack that there's a little bit of nonchalantness, if that's even a word when it comes to this team at times, but partly when you're so talented, that happens at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's kind of what I'm, I'm what I'm, uh, putting their problems on, like I haven't watched a lot of Clippers closely. I don't stay up for West Coast games. I'm an East Coast guy. So, you know, just kind of reading the tea leaves and, and seeing the things on social media and, and hearing what I've heard, my assumption would be just like, okay, like I, I trust this team to be talented enough to make it. I just wonder how far they can go because I think at one point, like when they beat the Celtics earlier this year, yeah. everybody was talking about, oh, they could win it in the Western Conference. And I even started to believe it a little bit. So, you know, I think Norm Powell's a great six man. I think that there's a lot of good players on this team. Uh, Daniel Tice, former Pacers on this team. Yeah. So I know he's, I don't know if he's playing more minutes than Plumlee. I saw the last game that Plumlee played more minutes than him, but I don't know if that was more. Yeah, they got quality bigs. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, they 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 have quality players. You know, one through eight, nine, ten. You know, uh, even a guy like Amir Coffey, who doesn't play a lot, is someone that I've always enjoyed watching play when he plays. Like, so. Uh, I think it's going to be they're going to be a tough matchup in the playoffs. That's that's how I feel about this team. I just hope they get it right before them because I kind of want to see that team at their best. I feel like they could be a really big challenge for some other teams in the uh, the Western Conference. So let's shift to the NBA coach of the year. Before we get there, do you feel NBA coaching is more important, less important than ever before? It seems more like a free flowing style of play, as you know really well, covering the Indiana Pacers. I think it matters still. Um, just because I've seen well, some it matters is it more or less than before, would you say, or the same? I think that it matters more because mm. there's so many players that you have to cater to nowadays. And I hate to say it like that, but so many guys want so many different things and it's the player empowerment era. And they have to kind of learn how to balance that out by also coaching their team hard. And, you know, I, I look at the situation here in Indiana, you know, they had named McMillan. He was known as the Sergeant and nobody, you know, the, the players were growing tired of that approach to, to coaching. It was kind of like a hard nosed coach. Right. So they go out and get this new trendy coach in Nate Bjorkren from Toronto, Nick nurse's oh, staff. That didn't work. No, it was terrible. He couldn't get any <laughs> assistance to come coach for him. Uh, some of the longtime assistants that were with Nate McMillan and with, I believe it was Kevin Pritchard in that group. Like they knew him. He was like, yeah, I'm out too. Like there was just some personal issues that went on. So ended up basically going through one year of COVID season with him. Nobody really even met him. He gets fired because he had terrible relationships with his players and tried to prioritize like Sabonis and Brogdon over the rest of the guys and guys kind of realized like they were like not at the top of the pecking order. Then they bring in a veteran like Rick Carlisle and you just see how much this team has grown so quickly and Rick kind of identified their problems and helped with the front office kind of see what the bigger picture was here. Like, Hey, we got to rebuild this thing from the scratch. You know, like we've got some pieces here, but we need to change this thing up. It's clearly not working. So I do think that from my personal experience here, like coaching matters and you just got to have smart coaches that know what they're doing. I think a lot of these coaches, like the young coaches that stick around, they get the best out of their teams. And that's two guys that I want to talk about for our coach of the year. Yeah, definitely. Talk about it. Actually, Rick probably would have been in the mix if you take away after Hallie got hurt. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think he should be in the mix, probably in the top five conversation. But uh, I think that honestly, for me, like everyone's going to probably lean towards Mark Dagnall from OKC. I would. But I'm I'm a big fan of what Jamal Mosley is doing in Orlando. Man, you got my same two guys. We're not supposed yes. to agree. I told you that before we started, <laughs> we're going to have no, the same well, two. You, you didn't name the guys, but I'm, I'm surprised. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, exactly the same. Okay, yeah. Uh, go ahead. I, I, I'm an Eastern Conference guy, so maybe I've seen more Mosley up close. But, I mean, Dagnall's done a great job with that group. I mean, SGA is an MVP candidate, but 
if you look at Orlando, like they don't have any MVP candidates on that team. They've got Mm -hmm. a lot of injuries they've dealt with. They've not had a lot of shooting this year either. They kind of are who they are. But one thing about this Orlando team, and maybe it's uh, uh, people can use it against them, but I actually use it to their credit. 19 and 0 this season against teams, the the bottom seven teams in the Eastern or in the NBA. 19 and 0 against the bottom feeders of the NBA, where if you look at the Pacers, they're 11 and 9. And four of those victories came against the Pistons. So really, they're more of a seven and nine team against the bottom six teams in the league. Uh, And to me, that's just like, okay. Orlando took care of business against the teams they should have beaten, right? Right. And and they found themselves now in a spot where everyone thought, oh, they might be fourth or fifth. No, I mean, the Cavs have lost a few games here and there as of late, and Orlando's not too far away from maybe potentially getting the three seed in the Eastern Conference. I understand the Eastern Conference is not nearly as tough as the West, and I know that Coach Dagnall's going through a lot with his roster being so young, Chet, Jalen, all those guys. Like I, I, I get it, so I'm not giving, you know, taking away anything from him. But I, I just think that Jamal Mosley, like he's a he's a Carlisle guy. Uh, there mm-hmm. was some weird stuff there that went down when he left uh, Dallas to come to Orlando. But you know what? I, I think that there's just some immense amount of respect for what he's done as a coach, and and I like the culture he's building down there in Orlando. Yeah, I love the culture as well, and a telltale sign of how good a coach is is the way that players buy in defensively, especially when you have young players like that. And defensively, they just been playing so well. They're on a string. They play hard. They play together. They seem to like each other. And I love everything he's doing. And he got rewarded with a contract extension, which probably should have been. He probably should have been asked to have an extension way earlier. But, you know, he got it now. And um, I, I love that team. I mean, I think there's going to be a debate for years. Who's going to be the Batman? Who's going to be the Robin of that team? I think Paulo's probably winning that debate as of right now because Franz's shooting numbers are a little bit down. But I love Franz Wagner as a player as well. Jalen Suggs is shooting it better, which has been a revelation for them. And they got a lot of young players who are really good. And definitely Jamal Mosley. And, you know, you can't take with Mark, you can't take away number one in the West with that young of a team. I, I actually said like way back, I, I did a pod way back that I think all OKC needed to turn the quarter into title contention was rim protection. And they, and they got that with Chet and now we're here, but I mean, I wouldn't have, have expected number one in the West. So mm. you got to tip your cap to Mark. Can I give you another wild card guy that I think just needs a little bit of a shout out here for how their team's played. And there's a couple of different guys that you could throw out, but I just feel like what Willie green's done in new Orleans yeah, nice yeah. turnaround for him. Uh, that team has been a, a team that everybody expected more out of, but Zion's finally starting to play at the level everybody kind of wanted him to play at. And, you know, they're right there in the thick of things. They're only a half game back of L.A. for for the fourth spot in the Western Conference. So, you know, they, they are a team that I think has impressed me this year because I didn't really expect much of them. I know they have got some really talented guys, but that's a, that's a, weird, that's a weird roster that's got a lot of players to play, and I think Willie Green's done a good job. Yeah, and he's still doing well with B.I. being out with his injury. It's funny, though. This is so situational. If Zion comes into the season in shape, I mean, he probably had a better chance to win it, right? Yeah, <laughs> probably so. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously there's other players and other coaches out there that deserve some some love. Bickerstaff, I think, from Cleveland, like the injuries they've battled all season long, too. But uh, if, if we keep going down the list, there's just too many guys to name. So, Most definitely. All right, let's get to our mailbag. Um, you know, what's crazy. I've been doing this podcast a long time. As you know, Alex, this is my first ever mailbag. Can you believe Seriously? it? Yeah. First mailbag for combos court. Th- this is combos court history right here. Alex, and what you're a doing? part of it. What are we doing? I appreciate that. I love yeah, a I good just, mailbag. I used to do okay. a weekly mailbag for our show. That's dope. I, I guess I'm not the biggest segments guy. I'm like, have a conversation guy. Yes, you know? I get that. Okay. Okay. But yeah, we're here though. First ever combos court mailbag presented by the NBA report. Don't forget to subscribe to the NBA report on YouTube. Okay. Drop a like as well. That thumbs up. All right. So Randall Wood on Twitter asks, what do you think that the playoff rotation looks like? And I'm assuming this is for your Pacers. Randall Wood is a faithful listener of setting the pace. We call our faithful listeners pace setters. Okay. Shouts to the pace setter, Randall Wood. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, uh, we've had this question before on a mailbag and a, a couple months ago, but we will answer here again. I think the starting five stay intact and they probably get an uptick in minutes. And then I think you're probably seeing closer to an eight man rotation of TJ McConnell at the point. I would assume Jalen Smith plays the backup center spot. And then he he might go nine deep, but I think Obi Toppin gets in there 
And then it's going to be between Ben Shepard and Doug McDermott. I, I I would lean more Ben Shepard just because of what he brings defensively. And I know that that might sound crazy to some fans listening to this because Ben Shepard was the 26th pick out of Belmont, who is a, a four-year you know college player. So he's really been good defensively. And every time you think about the Pacers defensive guys, you think of Andrew Nimhard, Aaron Neesmith. Well, Rick Carlisle continues to add uh, ben Shepard with that group of two uh, in terms of their best defenders that bring it every night. So that would be the nine-man rotation, in my opinion. Um, I could mm. see going to eight, uh, depending on how Obi Toppin plays, because I think Obi Toppin's such a wild card for this team, because if he's got it going offensively, like, you know, he can be a nice nice piece for this rotation. But if he's really struggling offensively and defensively, there can be a lot to be desired there with him. I could see them just riding Pascal Siakam like 45 minutes a game. Yeah. How has Toppin's defense been this year? There's been moments, right? Like if you go back earlier in the season, like one game that really stood out to me was his defensive effort against Jimmy Butler in Miami. Like it was one of the most incredible performances I've seen from Obi Toppin defensively, but it's been far and few between uh, when it comes to those defensive performances. He's more of a uh, a guy that plays with the bench now when he was a starter. And, and so like his goal isn't to go out there and guard the best player. Usually mm-hmm. it's, Let's get up and down the court, hit the open threes, you know, run in transition, yeah. get rebounds. It's kind of what Obi Toppin's known for. But yeah, yeah, they were that, asking him to play a bigger role when he was with uh when he was starting before Pascal Siakam got traded here. Yeah, I mean, I remember way back in the draft, there was always a thing about like obviously he's a crazy vertical at athlete, but laterally it's just that he's got like tight hips. It's a little bit tough for him. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. All right. Movement. <laughs> yeah, it's a, he, he's an interesting mover for sure. Um, okay, big bald man three one three on Twitter. How do you feel about the chances of the Bucks to come out the East? I will let you answer that one first, Alex, and then everybody who watches the NBA report knows my answer already. But uh, I'll reiterate it. So you go ahead first. I mean, does the Doc Rivers curse carry over to Milwaukee? <laughs> I mean, honestly, does it? Like, we'll have to see. <laughs> Can he get out of the second round? I mean, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with this Bucks team. I, I think that they are probably the favorites to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. I would say that Boston's clearly the other favorite. I think Boston's the favorite to get to the NBA Finals this year. Mm-hmm. And if I had to pick one, I would pick Boston just because I trust them enough, especially with the additions they've made and I think the improved, uh, you know, defense this year from Derek White, Drew Holiday together. Like they're just a very dynamic team if they can stay yeah. healthy. But you know, Milwaukee's playing better. There's no doubt about it. I think Doc Rivers, while he does get crapped on quite a bit for some of the stuff he does and his shenanigans and inability to make adjustments, uh, yeah. they've done a good job of kind of figuring out who they are as a team when I felt like their identity was a bit lost with Adrian Griffin as the head coach. A bit of an awkward firing there in the middle of the season for a team that was playing pretty well. Didn't have a losing record, but I think the Pacers beating them four out of five times kind of broke him there a little bit, and the team lost trust in him. So the Dame factor is going to be a, a, a thing too because Dame's not a great defender. Uh, that's my biggest concern with them is their ability to guard on the perimeter. Um, but if they get into a matchup somehow in the second round with like a New York Knicks team and the Knicks are healthy, I could see that going seven games. I could see New York beating them. So yeah, I, I could see them. I, I would be shocked if they get knocked out in the first round unless for some reason they play Miami again. Uh, which is possible, but I would expect them to at least make it to round two with the possibility of being knocked out in round two. So I had the, the Bucks winning the East before the season, and I'm going to stick with it. And I've okay. said this many times on this pod. I just believe in Giannis and Dame more than any other duo in the East. Now, there is concerns that Dame plays a lot better when Giannis is out. So that's something Doc Rivers has to work on. He has to feature Dame more, I believe, and let Giannis work around the edges because Giannis is going to get his 30 and 10 no matter what. Like, you don't really have to feature him. So I think he needs to take some of what the Blazers did. It hurts that Terry Stotts isn't there. Like, he was there for, like, it felt like a week. That would have helped a lot with things. But, you know, they need to feature Dame and make sure he's comfortable with Giannis. And the defense has to be good enough. You're right. And that is somewhat of an issue with Dame. But I just believe in those two guys more than any other duo in the East. And I, I think they are improving upon things. And I do think they come out the East. Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a bold take there combo. I think <laughs> that's, that's what everybody tells me, but I'm sticking with it. I'm sticking with it. I respect it. Okay. Now we got to shift to the New York Knicks. A lot of Knicks fans watch this channel. 
and uh, they're going to be interested in this next one. We've talked about it before on the pod, but um, Andrew Abraham, if healthy, what is the ceiling for the New York Knicks? Well, I, I kind of just teased it there a little bit, so I do apologize, but I, I think if right. this team is healthy, OG Ananobi is a difference maker. Mitch Robinson is a difference maker. What Julius Randle is going to show up and how short will that leash be with Tom Thibodeau if he doesn't play well? Could they go with mm. OG Ananobi at the four and kind of just figure out a way to win in spite of what we saw from Randle? Because I felt like Randle last year in the playoffs was just not very good. Uh there was moments, right? But there's other times where I'm just like, yeah, I'm not feeling this. The you Cavs know? series was pretty good, right? Yeah. The the second series against Miami, he really struggled. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously Miami made the final. So yeah, got to figure out the right balance there. But if if it's like that again, or if the shoulder injury continues to bother him, like, okay, what are they going to do? But I mean, uh, I think that this team can make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. I really do. Uh, I think that Jalen Brunson has been so good. I think Josh Hart a great pickup, uh, Devin Chinzo, while he's a little bit of a chucker for me, uh, the efficiency might not be there, but he he can hit big shots. So he's been in big moments before. So yeah, I, I like I like this Knicks team. I think they can make it to the Eastern Conference Finals if the cards fall right. It's interesting. I totally agree with you when it comes to Eastern Conference Finals, and I would even go Finals. I, I would even go Finals. I really? did say, as a ceiling, and I did say the Bucks. I do think the Bucks will win, but I do think there's a chance for them to make it to the finals. Look, I don't think anybody beats Denver, no matter who comes out the East, especially the way they're playing now, if they stay healthy. But I mean, Brunson is playing at a high, high level and you can't, you can't underestimate chemistry. Like there's this thing where like, you know, Tibbs and, and Brunson have this thing where they knew each other since Brunson was a kid. They got the Nova chemistry. Like that's really good. And it's interesting that you did bring up Randall. Cause I wonder if he even, like it's going to be tough to reiterate them with this team who's just playing free flowing basketball with this Nova Knicks version. They're like doubling down on the Nova Knicks and it's been working so well. But mm -hmm. if the, I mean he Julius Randle is an All NBA player and they're playing like this without him, so that's another way to look at it that they could get even better. Jason Temp was on my pod and I mean he said he said from what I remember, if I remember correctly, that for him the ceiling was a title, but it was an wow. outside but it was an outside chance if I'm not mistaken. That's what I remember from what he said, but yeah, I, I think they're a really interesting team. And, and I mean, Jalen Brunson's playing at an all MV, all NBA level. And I think he's even playing at an MVP level at this point. No, there's no doubt about that. I think that you got to give Jalen Brunson his flowers for how great he's played this year. First time all-star probably should have been a two time all-star. You know, uh, I think that there was question marks last year of whether it was Jalen Brunson's team or Julius Randall's team. But Who was the know. better player? I think know. we know now it's Jalen yeah. Brunson's team. And man, what a what a blunder by the Dallas Mavericks to not keep him. I mean, there I know that there's you that's, know some uh, go ahead. But that's interesting. Do you think we see this Jalen Brunson playing alongside Luca? Probably not. I mean, because Luca controls the ball so much, but like still he's just a great player. Eddie. He's a he great would, player. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. let guys like that walk out your building for nothing. And right. I think Dallas has really yeah. just kind of been treading water with the moves they've made since that move. I mean, that's fair. I mean, Kyrie and Luca's working really well. And I remember people saying like Luca really liked Jalen, like that would have inevitably, that would inevitably worked eventually as well. So totally agree with you. All right. Mm -hmm. in the, a little bit of draft talk, Alex, in this upcoming draft, who will the Knicks draft as a small forward or power forward? Tyler, Tyler Smith from the ignite, Baba Miller, I've been talking about Bob Miller for a long time. I mean, he didn't show everything he should have shown at the college level, but um, I really liked his game for a long time now. And uh, by the way, this is by Oro Solido on Twitter. But um, yeah, I mean, they're going to be drafting late teens, early 20s. Um, I have somebody for them, but but I'll let you go first. Well, I mean, for me, there's a couple of different guys here, but but one guy that I've just kind of, kept my eyes on recently and I think would make some sense for them is Oso Igadaro. Okay. Uh six foot nine big out of uh Marquette. And I, I feel like he's got great feel for the game. I his he's not a great three point shooter, right? But I don't think you have to be a three point shooter in the Tom Thibodeau system where there's other teams you have to be a, a, a threat from outside like Indiana because that's exactly what they want. But you know, I, I think he's a gifted passer. 
uh, if you watch him kind of process the game, I think he does that at a very high level. So uh, any anytime a guy has good feel for like the game and how they play and finding cutters and that kind of thing, I, I really do like that. So, um, you know, not an elite level athlete at all, pretty mm-hmm. just kind of basic, but I feel like for this draft with it being kind of under the radar a little bit, He's a guy that I've got my name on, and I know he's been kind of floated in between the first and second round, so we'll be interested to see where he ends up falling. Yeah. Upside and feel for the game are like the two biggest things I look for in the draft. Mm-hmm. I don't know I don't know if feel for the game is the first thing Tibbs looks for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think he just wants gritty guys who play defense, who play a tip style of basketball. But uh, I'm going to go with Ryan Dunn out of Virginia, mm. uh, 6'8", defensive specialist. I think he fits – the way Tibbs wants to play basketball. And he's another guy with a lack of shooting. So that's usually a skill, a skill you could acquire over time. So that works for both of our prospects we mentioned, but it's mm. going to be, it's going to definitely be interesting who they take. Um, let's go. Daniel, our test, the, our test effect podcast shouts to Daniel. He asked the OKC thunder are 0.5 games out of first place in the West. If this was to hold, or if OKC surpasses Denver, what's the realistic chance that SGA wins MVP? Daniel Artes, the nine four five zero. Man, this is a good question. Um, it is. I haven't even looked at the MVP odds to be honest with you, so I don't even know who the favorite is right now. I know he's been in the mix all season long. I feel like Jokic has also been up there in the mix. Is there it's somebody Yo- else it's, that I'm it's missing? Jokic? It's Jokic as of right now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean Luca. Luca's Luka, numbers are crazy, but yeah, yeah. I, I don't think Luca's going to get it just based on where they are at in the standings. So, and I, and I think, and I, I feel like for some reason people don't love Luca as much as maybe uh, fans do. For some reason, I think it might be just the complaining that he does on a night to night basis. I mean, SGA, I, I love that kid. I think what he said after one of the post game interviews was so incredible. Like consistent. Consistent. Yeah. yeah he said, yeah. that's just me. That's my life. My life is consistent. And I was like, you know what? I respect it. And then you got Jokic over here who just does the same thing. And I, Jokic is the best player in the league. There's no doubt yes. about it to me. Yes. As much as I want to give it to SGA, I, I think he's a runner up no matter what. I think, I, I think that Jokic should win it once again. Uh, maybe that's just bias from, from what I've seen from him so far, but he just, he continues to amaze me with the stuff that he does. I mean, even though I've seen it for like the last four years, it still is baffling sometimes like, man, he's just so tough. Like, Every time you feel like you have a game close, like he just hits every big shot. It, it just feels like there's not a big shot that he doesn't miss. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Um, yo, as you said, Jokic, best player in the world. I, I think like for SGA to win, he's probably going to have to put up, and this sounds crazy, like even crazier numbers just to surpass Jokic. Like they're going to have to force feed of the ball. They're going to have to do some stuff because the way the Denver has been playing after the um, all-star break, it's just phenomenal. And he picks teams apart at the end of games. And there's really, he's just absolute conundrum at the end of games. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the numbers are there. He's the best player in the world. I think he is the MVP. I don't really see a way SGA wins it, but I, I think it'd be really fun if it did. I think it'd be really fun if he did. I I think he's going to be runner up. That would be my guess right now. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. There was the first ever combos court mailbag. Alex. Thanks for joining in on the show. Where can we find you? Social media and everywhere else. Yeah, everybody, you guys can check me out on social media at Alex Golden NBA. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram at, at that handle. And you can find my link tree uh, uh, in the in the description there to kind of find all the work that we do there for the pod, for my written work, which I don't do nearly as much now as I'm strictly focusing on podcasting here with the busy schedule that is life when you're working 50 hours a week plus doing this on the, on the side. So it's, it's not like I can just commit to this full time and, and the writing and everything. So uh, I have dedicated more of myself to the podcast, but still uh, occasional written articles out there. There is a piece out there from a couple weeks ago uh, with our interview with Chad Buchanan that was on the podcast, but I did turn that into an article for the, for the spicy takes, or I should say the good conversation that we had, the highlights of that conversation. Multi-purposing across multiple yes. platforms. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Subscri- <what> I do. <laughs> Subscribe to setting the pace. Subscribe to combos court. You know, give me a like, give us a like, give us a subscribe for the NBA report. Alex, thanks so much for taking the time and talk soon. All right, Combo. Thank you. Anytime.